add. So that inability to prove that link between pornography and violence to women has become a major standing obstacle in their way, in their fight against pornography. Um, there, were, there have been two presidential commissions of, on pornography, one under President Nixon and one under President um, uh, Carter. And the two of them came to the same conclusion, that it's, we can prove that there is a correlation between pornography and violence against women. They did these experimental studies. They actually they, they looked at the many experimental studies that have been done. With the, they would have a group of students watch pornography day and night for, for a few days, volunteers, of course, and then another group of students uh, not watch any pornography. And then they would pass some tests. What do you feel now? Do you feel more uh, inclined to use violence against women? They, they couldn't find that link. <coughs> but the radical feminists insist that there is um, such a link. Furthermore, pornography for the radical feminists is censorship on women's speech. Pornography is censorship on women's speech. Because through pornography, which is a slander, which projects a false image of women, men don't take women seriously. So when they seek a job, they're not taken seriously because we know what women are like. Because we've seen it in the movies, in the commercials. We can't trust them. So, so McKinnon says pornography acts in a, in a sexist society the same as racist propaganda in a, an already racist society. In, it confirms social prejudice against the whole sector of society. That's what pornography does. So pornography slanders women, it's slander against women, and porno pornography prevents women's speech from being taken seriously. So pornography is a denial of women equality, women's equality. And as we will see, Catherine McKinnon, in her book, Only Words, makes a big deal of this, of this collision, this conflict between pornography, sorry, between freedom of speech and equality. What goes first, freedom of speech or equality? Well, or in general terms, freedom or equality? Well, the answer is equality. Equality always goes first. If something has to give up, that's freedom. You can never tumble over freedom, in the, I'm sorry, over equality in the name of freedom. Equality, equality of opportunity at least, uh, goes first, always. Equality is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, while freedom of speech is guaranteed by the First Amendment. In fact, there are certain forms of speech which are prohibited because they are the denial of other people's equality. What forms of speech, what speech acts are prohibited? They're treated as acts. What threatening, threats. Um, crying fire in the middle of a crowd if there's no fire. Slander. All of those things are just words, but they are treated as acts and you can be punished in court. For, for uttering those words. That's why the title of McKinnon's book, Only Words, she's being ironic. Yeah, right. Pornography is only words. It's not only words. That's what she means. It's more, it's acts. And pornography, she says, should not be treated as one more form of expression, one more form of speech, but as an act, the same as slander, threats, as crying fire. She makes that point in her book, okay? <clears throat> now, the radical feminists have been relatively successful, especially in the 70s and 80s. In fact, McKinnon and Dorkin were hired um, in the early 80s by the, cities of, the city councils of Indianapolis and Minneapolis to draft civil legislation that would make uh, pornography production and distribution a, 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 a civil crime. A, person, a, a pornographer, and what they call a pornographer is a, someone who produces pornography or who um, distributes it, could be sued by any woman, by any woman, for a slander. 
And even a woman who had willingly participated in a pornographic production after signing a contract could still sue and say, I didn't know what I was doing. I was being brainwashed. Well, the legislations were never passed. In one case, the, the mayor vetoed it. In another case, the courts struck it down as unconstitutional. And many feminists were very upset at this because they said, well, if now we say that we sign a contract and the next day we say we didn't know what we were doing, who's going to take us seriously? We're going back to the 19th century when a woman's signature meant nothing. So that was the pr main criticism addressed uh, against the, the radical feminists uh, when they did this kind of uh, uh, legislation in, in uh, Minneapolis and Indianapolis. By the way, did you know that we are in the heart of the pornography production world here at Northridge? Did you know that? Yes? Amazing. Um, more than 95% of the commercially manufactured pornography made each year in the United States, more than 95% of all pornographic movies, is produced in a nine square mile triangle in Los Angeles County that has the towns of Canoga Park, Chatsworth, and Northridge as its vertices. So this is a very appropriate topic for us to discuss, right? This, this is the world. <laughs> the heart of the pornography world. Um, now, um, let me show you the book that Nadine Strossen um, published when, she, when her invitation was, was, was withdrawn from this debate because Catherine McKinnon said, there are no two feminist vo points of view. There's only one, it's me. And so they withdrew the invitation from Nadine Strossen. She wrote this book called Defending Pornography. She's not really defending pornography, but she's, she's making fun of the radical feminists and she's defending freedom of speech. And she tells you lots of anecdotes. For example, the radical feminists you'd use a very peculiar tactic in their campaign, which is to show pornography. Because for them, pornography is not about sex. Pornography for the radical feminists is about power. It's not about sex, it's power. So they have no scruples in showing pornography in public. So if you see, if you attend, uh, I remember the first time I attended a, a radical feminist um, presentation was at USC when I was a graduate student at USC. And it was a full-blown, hardcore pornography show from beginning to end with some little um, talk at the end. But that was pretty much what it was. And that they do that all the time. They publish their books to show how bad pornography is. They show you pornography, right? So this is a typical radical feminist book. Tractate uh, against pornography, the evidence of the harm, with a warning about the visuals in the book. It's pornography from beginning to end, right? This pretty disgusting pornography, kind of sadomasochistic pornography. But they need to show that. That has got them then into trouble. And Nadine Strossen tells us about some of these situations. For example, the, a group of radical feminists had a stand in the New York subway, um, and they were, you know, they had lots of pornographic posters all over, all around, and some people, some passersby complained to the police. And so the police came and they confiscated all of this pornography. And the radical feminists complained. And of all places, you know what they, where they went to complain? To the American Civil Liberties Union and ask them to, to take their case, take up their case, their right to show pornography in public. And they won. So the radical feminists won the right to show pornography in public. So they tried to find the most disgusting kind of pornography there is to show this link between pornography, male attitudes, and violence. But I guess unable to find bad enough pornography they, the radical feminists finally ended up producing their own pornography. So they've written a number of pornographic books under Dorking House, for example. And you know what? You know what the funny thing is? They were successful, especially successful in Canada. The this Canadian Supreme Court used the radical feminist arguments to curtail 
pornography in Canada. They closed down most adult bookstores, and pornography was pretty